Okay, welcome uh, to everyone here. My thanks uh, for you all taking the trouble to attend uh, this workshop. SSI is very pleased to be able to um, uh, act as the host. So some of you may remember SSI and know uh, what it's about, but I'm gonna just give you two or three slides as an introduction. So next one, please. So SSI next year will be 40 years old, which is a little hard to, to believe. It was started by Professor Gerard K. O'Neill, uh, another physicist, I'm afraid, uh, from Princeton University back um, in 1977. And his goal was to open the space frontier to all of humanity and to utilize the resources and energy uh, therein um, to support our, our future evolution and expansion into the cosmos. Our approach is not as, a, as an advocacy organization. We're not interested in lobbying for bigger budgets at NASA or, or anywhere for that matter. Uh, our approach is to engage uh, with researchers in the field to produce technological innovations that make this feasible. And it's obviously a huge challenge and we have some particular ideas about the approach that we want to take. Next slide. So our legacy is that principally we've done work with the lunar polar orbiter, uh, lunar prospector concepts in the 1980s and even before that uh, with MIT and Princeton University on the mass driver approach to moving asteroids and um, taking uh, resources off the surface of the moon and using them for purpose-built uh, human settlements in space. Uh, to this end, we sponsored uh, 14 conferences to date, uh, typically on about two or three year centers, and uh, published the books in cooperation, the proceedings in cooperation with the AAA. Uh, just like these proceedings will ultimately reach the, the public as well. Next slide. So we ha have at the moment three initiatives. Um, one is ambitious um, beyond the <laughs> Uh, almost any dreams that I have to, to be able to uh, actually um, fund and build, but it's hugely important, and that's the G Lab. I'll talk about that uh, just for about 20 seconds. Second is E Lab, which is an environmental, a closed loop environmental system that's going to be necessary for permanent human space settlements and, of course, also for uh, starships. And then the third, where we, we really didn't take leave of our senses, uh, we we wanted to move into the exotic propulsion arena. And that, um, uh, that was challenging because in the past, our work has been very solidly grounded in engineering and, and physics. And of course, exotic propulsion is a pretty controversial uh, subject. Does that mean just the F lab for the fun lab? Uh, I haven't thought about what kind of lab to call that. <laughs> F lab is not a bad idea. So, so. Next, next slide. So G-Lab, uh, while it doesn't have any um, relation to this workshop, I wanted to mention it because you never can tell if uh, someone in the audience knows a rich billionaire who wants to have their name on, on the G-Lab. It's going to be a very expensive project to do, but it's also critical to our future survival in space. Uh, yesterday, uh, someone in the audience started talking about the issues of going to Mars and living on the Martian surface. We completely agree with this. We, our, our fear is that humans might not be able to survive at G levels uh, below what we evolved at, i.e. one. Yeah, that that's the biggest, we, we may be able to fix everything else about living on a planetary surface, radiation, perchlorates, you name it, in the case of Mars, but can we fix uh, the, the G-force, and that's the critical issue as far as we're concerned. And what's appalling is after half a trillion dollars of expenditures and 50 years of the activities of the space agencies of the world in space, we have no clue to, the, to this answer. We simply have no idea. So, next slide. So what we're looking at is, are we, is it a linear relationship? to health? Is there some sort of positive relationship that may exist? Is there some sort of 
negative relationship. I mean, by default, we sort of have to think that there's probably a negative relationship because we, we look at microgravity and we see horrific effects on, on um, astronauts and cosmonauts. So the dream of living on planets with less than, uh, or moons with less than 1G is potentially just a dream. We might explore them, uh, but we may not be able to live on them. So next slide. So to answer that question, we need to build a rotating uh, artificial gravity uh, centrifuge in space and raise generations of animals uh, in this facility. This is probably a human-tended facility uh, in conjunction with ISS, the International Space Station. This has been proposed in the past, actually attached to ISS, but since we're going to be talking a lot about momentum at this meeting, uh, you can probably appreciate that people who want to do microgravity research on ISS don't really like the notion of the largest momentum wheel in, in orbit physically attached to their structure. <laughs> because wherever that momentum wheel wants to go is where the ISS is going to follow, not the other way around. Uh, so they, the two have to be separated, and NASA's and the European Space Agencies and such, and the Russians have never come to, to grips with that problem. So we would like to fund it, and we'd like to put Paul Allen's name on it, or Bill Gates' name on it, or somebody's name on it, just like they buy a building at Stanford, we can do the same thing. The eLab initiative is tied to that because closed life support is obviously necessary for such facilities, but I won't go into any uh, detail on it. It's a much less ambitious project because a lot more people are working on that issue than on gravity. Next one. So this is where I want to end, is on the exotic propulsion initiative. Uh, I admit this is a personal interest of mine. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you how that interest began. When I was 10 years old, I read Arthur Clarke's Profiles of the Future. And there's a chapter in Profiles of the Future which talks about space, the unconquerable. And the fact that uh, the, the, the last paragraph of that chapter says, no man will ever turn homeward from beyond Vega to greet those he knew and loved on Earth. And that's because Vega is 26 light years away. And, a human lifetime doesn't really permit this. So, at, at least at, uh, at light speed. So I, um, when you're 10 years old, you don't like to be told you can't do something. Uh, so 10 years later, I had the opportunity to sit with Arthur for an evening at his club, the Theatre Arts Club in London, uh, and talk to him about this and other subjects. And I remember that conversation pretty distinctly, as you might expect, and the, the one thing I did say to him is I, I wanted to prove him wrong on that point. And instead of him patting me on the head as a 22-year-old, wet-behind-the-ears kid, um, I'm, I'm eternally grateful for the fact that he said to me, you know, you may have a chance, and encouraged me. And then he told me something else, which he's written as well in some of his, um, his um, commentaries. And that was, he said, to be successful, you need to find a physicist who will give you a straight answer to the question, what is inertia? <laughs> now, I'm a simple-minded rocket plumber, okay? I'm, you know, liquid rocket engines are my specialty, launch vehicles are my specialty. Physics and I never got along, so I'm only going to understand one in every three words that's said at this workshop. But I remembered those words. And next slide. And without denigrating anyone else's work and M drives or other exotic propulsion systems, I want to say that the first physicist I encountered who gave me a straight answer to that question was Jim Woodward about 10 years ago. And that's really what got me kicked off. And, and once I became, when Freeman Dyson said, could you take over the presidency of SSI? Uh, and I said, yes, uh, that, uh, that was one project I really wanted to, to get going. Um, so 
I will leave you with one thing, and I may be stealing Jim and Heidi's thunder on this particular point, uh, and I apologize if I am, but uh, a few months ago I, I visited their lab, and uh, Jim had just implemented a little piece of software in the way he powers up his device, a quadratic ramp up of power. And I said, uh, I looked at it and I said, that, that's pretty cool. You know, it was a single pulse and we saw the red thrust pulse and the blue power pulse and so on. And I said, can you do two of those? And he said, well, you know, there's heating effects and you have to worry about depolarizing the piezoelectric stack and, you know, raising things above their Curie temperature and so on. I said, yeah, but can you do two of those? And uh, I left, and it was like a day or two later, next slide, I get this. I, I apologize for the quality of it, but I just um, slapped this together last night. And so we see five pulses, and they all look pretty much the same. And I wrote him back an email when he sent this, and I said, this looks to me like a space drive. What's the X and Y, Gary? Um, let's see, what, am, what are we looking at? This, um, let Jim and Heidi e explain it, but the red is the thrust pulse, the blue is the power pulse, and this is a quadratic ramp of power. In any case, um, to a simple-minded engineer, this looked rather interesting, and I, I certainly hope to see um, evidence at this workshop that um, there, there's more uh, interesting research uh, to come and results to be, uh, be presented. So I borrowed a little line from uh, Galileo Galilei, uh, you know, nevertheless it does move. <laughs> so with that, I again like to thank you all for attending. Uh, if there's anything any of the SSI staff can do to make uh, your visit uh, and the workshop um, uh, more profitable to you, please let us know. And, um, and I guess I'll put in a plug if anybody wants to go to SSI.org and sign up as a senior associate, we always can use the money. Thanks very much. Oh, and yes, we have badges.